key factors for a high VO2 max or high cardiac output, blood volume, and hemoglobin levels. In theory, infusing red blood cells directly into circulation would provide an almost immediate increase in a person's aerobic capacity. In recent years, many high-profile athletes have admitted to reinfusing red blood cells in preparation for big races. But does it actually provide an immediate increase in VO2 max and endurance performance? And if so, how much does it increase it? It has been known for decades that elevated hemoglobin levels are associated with high maximal oxygen consumption values. An increase in hemoglobin concentration increases arterial oxygen content and oxygen transport, which leads to an increase in VO2 max and endurance performance. Erythrocythemia is the clinical term for an increase in red blood cell mass per unit volume of blood. The most common method of this that's used by athletes is to remove a unit of blood and store it. Wait a few weeks to allow for the body's blood volume and red blood cell levels to return to normal, and then reinfuse the stored blood back into circulation. In the early 1970s, the reinfusion of red blood cells was dubbed blood doping by the media. But because blood doping is now often associated with the use of recombinant erythropoietin, better terms to use for describing the reinfusion of autologous red blood cells is blood boosting or blood packing. Blood boosting has a long history of use by athletes. One of the first reported uses was by five-time Tour de France champion Jean Anquetil in the early 1960s. After the 1968 Mexico City Olympic Games, during which many of the endurance events were won by athletes who lived and trained at altitude, blood boosting became more common among athletes. In 1972, Finnish distance runners allegedly used blood transfusions leading up to the Olympic Games. In the 1980 Olympics, Finnish runner Carlo Manico won the bronze medal in the 5K and the silver medal in the 10K. He later admitted to using blood transfusions at those games. The last straw in the use of blood boosting occurred in the 1984 Olympics. The U.S. cycling team broke a 72-year Olympic medal drought by winning nine medals. Seven members of the team, including four medalists, later admitted to using blood transfusions leading up to their events. Following the 1984 Olympics, the International Olympic Committee banned the practice of blood boosting. A few research studies on this topic had been published prior to the 1970s, but the key study that marked the beginning of the scientific evidence on this topic occurred in 1972 in a study by Bjorn Ekblom and colleagues. In this study, three male college students each completed a VO2 max test. The next day, they had 800 milliliters of whole blood removed. Four weeks later, the red blood cells were reinfused back into their bloodstream, and the next day they completed another VO2 max test. All three subjects experienced an immediate improvement in their maximal aerobic capacity of 9% and an increase in exercise performance of 23%. This provided the first definitive evidence of the performance benefits of blood boosting. Ekblom's article received interest by a couple of mainstream magazines. In 1973, Time Magazine discussed this study in an article on the potential benefits of blood boosting for middle and long distance runners. And this article, published in Sports Illustrated in 1985, documenting the 1984 U.S. cycling team's blood boosting, SI asked Dr. Eckbloom for his thoughts. They reported that Eckbloom disassociated himself from the current controversy, saying that his work was done in the spirit of basic research and that he couldn't help it if others used the results to improve the performance of athletes. That is unethical. After Ekblom published the study in 1972, he continued to study this topic. In 1976, Ekblom, Wilson, and Ostrand were able to replicate the results in a second study. This figure presents some compelling evidence supporting Ekblom's initial findings. On the x-axis are the results of the baseline VO2 max test presented in liters per minute. On the y-axis are the VO2 max results after blood reinfusion. The diagonal line in the middle is called the line of perfect identity. If there is no difference between the two conditions, all of the values would fall on the line of perfect identity. If reinfusion decreased the subject's VO2 max, their values would fall below the line. If reinfusion increased their VO2 max, the data points would fall above the line. When you plot the data point for each subject from the 1976 study, along with each subject from the 1972 study, you can see that all of the subjects demonstrated an improvement in their VO2 max after reinfusion. 
In the Ekblom studies, the order of the tests were the same, with all subjects completing a baseline VO2 max test first, then later they completed a VO2 max test after reinfusing blood. It could be argued that because the subjects in Ekblom studies were not consistently training at a high level, there may have been a training effect from the first VO2 max test that was evident in the follow-up test after the reinfusion. Also, the knowledge that the second test occurred after the reinfusion of blood may have given the subjects a psychological boost. In a very elegantly designed study, Buick and colleagues recruited a population of world-class runners who were in a maintenance phase of their training program. The subjects were split into two groups. One group had their blood reinfused prior to their follow-up VO2 max test, while the other group received a sham reinfusion of saline. Their results were consistent with previous research. VO2 max increased by around 4 milliliters per kilogram per minute almost immediately after the reinfusion whereas there is no change in VO2 max in the sham condition. Similar results have also been found in a group of nine college-aged women. This study found an increase in VO2 max of 4.3 mLs per kg per minute with a VO2 max remaining elevated for about eight days. The results of these studies appear to be consistent, but to really understand the literature on this topic, we should refer to a meta-analytic approach to investigate the results of the studies on this. I searched and searched the literature but I was not able to find a published meta-analysis on the impact of blood boosting on VO2 max. So I did the analysis myself. In this analysis, I only included studies that use blood boosting within the same subjects using a pre-post study design. The study also needed to report the specific VO2 max and or performance results. Here are all the studies that reported VO2 max data. On the right is a forest plot. The zero line is the anchor point. Any results on the left of the zero line indicates that the VO2 max was higher before blood boosting occurred. Those results on the right side of the zero line reflects an improvement in VO2 max after blood boosting. The strength of a meta-analysis is that you can objectively determine the overall conclusions based on the results of all the research on the topic. For this analysis, I converted the results into an effect size to allow for an apples-to-apples -apples comparison across studies. As you can see, almost all of the studies showed an improvement in VO2 max after blood boosting with every study being statistically different from zero. Only one study showed that VO2 max was lower after blood boosting. This study had some odd results, but I didn't find a valid reason to exclude it from the analysis. On the forest plot, the diamond represents the overall effect size with the center of the diamond representing the mean and the width representing the 95% confidence interval. Even when including the COT study, you can see that the overall effect size was 0.49, which is considered a moderately high effect size. Because most studies reported the VO2 max in mLs per kg per minute, or I was able to calculate the relative VO2 max based on the data that they provided, I also ran a meta-analysis on the difference in the means of the VO2 max. This allows us to evaluate the data using units that we're more familiar with. Overall, blood boosting increased VO2 max by 3.55 mLs per kg per minute. This isn't a huge number, but it was statistically significant and represents an improvement in VO2 max of about 6% over baseline. But does this improvement in VO2 max translate into an actual increase in endurance exercise performance? Here are the effect sizes for all of the studies that reported endurance performance outcomes. Notice the weird data from the COT study from the previous graphs. This was the only study that reported VO2 max decreased with blood boosting, but they reported the largest increase in exercise performance. Really strange results. Overall, endurance performance was improved with blood boosting with a moderate to large effect size of 0.759. This data represents an overall increase in performance of 17%. That's a pretty big increase. Does this mean that a person who is running an 18 minute 5K could see their race time cut to 15 minutes with blood boosting? Well, not exactly. There are a lot of different ways that exercise performance was reported in these studies. In some of the early studies, including those by Ekblom, they simply reported exercise performance based on the total duration of the VO2 max test. There are no major issues statistically with using VO2 max test duration as a measure of performance, but because of the gradual nature of the test, it really doesn't represent any useful practical information about exercise performance. Another method that is sometimes used is an exercise to exhaustion protocol. During this type of test, the subject will exercise at a submax intensity until they cannot continue. These types of protocols can provide more clear differences between test groups, but they are not considered to be ecologically valid. 
They may be more appropriate for testing performance during military or occupational types of tasks. But rarely does the winner of a race result from the last person left standing. Most of the time, we tend to think that race results are based on a time trial format. The person who wins is the one who finishes the predetermined distance in the shortest amount of time. In research, these types of time trial formats are presented in a number of different ways. How quickly can the subjects complete a predetermined distance or by measuring the work completed in a predetermined amount of time? I ran a subgroup meta-analysis in which I analyzed the study effect sizes based on the performance test mode that they used. When we grouped our data in this way, we can see that the effect sizes were very different when the study used a non-ecologically valid test versus an ecologically valid test. There was a lot of variability when using the VO2 max test duration or the exercise to exhaustion format with the average performance differences of about 22 to 28 percent. However, during a time trial format, the performance improvement was a little over 6 percent. This was very similar to the improvement in VO2 max that we saw previously. So does blood boosting work? Yes, it increased VO2 max by about 6 percent and it can also improve race performance by about 6 percent. These aren't huge improvements, but they can definitely make a big difference among elite athletes where tiny improvements can be huge. That being said, I'm not advocating that you should do this. In fact, don't do it. It's prohibited, unethical, and potentially dangerous to your health.